How are you guys? Good? How many of you guys still feel stuffed from Thanksgiving with all the leftovers? I saw a quote on Facebook um, that my friend posted, and the quote said, The meal is not done when I'm full. The meal is done when I hate myself. <laughs> How many of you guys hated yourself around 6 o'clock on Thursday? It's, it's, it's sad that we give ourselves the license to eat like we never eat on Thanksgiving Day. But How many of you guys is Thanksgiving your favorite holiday of the year? Anyone? One person? Two, three, four. Okay. How, how about cri- Christmas? Is Christmas? All right. Yeah. Statistically, Christmas is number one, and Thanksgiving is always number two. And that's for all uh, genders, and, and for both genders and for all age groups. So Christmas and then Thanksgiving. For me, it was Independence Day. My dad's birthday is on the 4th of July, and so I have a lot of memories just going down to the Jersey Shore, seeing the fireworks, and just having a good time. But my wife, she was here at the first service, at, at the 9.30 service. Her favorite is Thanksgiving. Now, I didn't say this in the first service, but she, she's a big-time foodie. She loves to eat. She loves food. And, but it, that's not why Thanksgiving is her favorite holiday. It, it's for other reasons. I remember when she first told me this was um, when we first got together. Uh, I, I really didn't understand why Thanksgiving was her favorite holiday. I was like, that's kind of strange. But... I recognize or I realize why Thanksgiving was her favorite holiday the first time I spent Thanksgiving dinner with her and her family. Some of you guys may do this. So her and her family, they actually eat at the dinner table, which my family never did growing up. Um, So they actually eat at the dinner table. And after they're done with their meal, the festivities pretty much move to the living room. And for about an hour or more, they're just sharing with each other for all the things that they are thankful for. To God, thankful to God for all that he's done and thankful and appreciative of one another. And I tell you, that first time there, I mean, they didn't like me at first. And I'll tell you guys that. (laughs) I I mean, I had long hair, baggy pants, big clothes. I I was only 18 or 19 when we first got together. Um, But something happened and and they really expressed their appreciation for me. Um, as well as expressing gratitude for so many other things that were, was going on in their life. And this is every year, and every year, I tell you, it's an emotional time in their household. Very emotional, very powerful. You can't help but leave there appreciated, and you can't help leave there encouraged. I mean, very powerful time. I mean, if you've never done it, I encourage you to do it. And, and so we're, today we're going to be talking about Thanksgiving, and this is usually a message that you would hear the Sunday before Thanksgiving. This is sometimes a message that's preached for those churches that have services on Thursday morning. Um, you hear something like this, but I believe the power in gratitude is so great that I believe it's an attitude and a character that we should carry on throughout our lives. It's something that we should possess as a character, as, a, as an attitude that we walk with day by day. Such, such power... It affects the relationship between the giver and the receiver, that, that person who is expressing gratitude and that person receiving gratitude. One, this week, um, I think it was Friday, um, Honor and I were home, B was working, I was doing dishes and he was watching TV and um, I could see out the window that his little buddy Orlando was outside playing with, with his mom. And uh, so I knock on the window and Orlando gets all excited. I open the window and Orlando asks for Honor. Honor's like, What's going on? Is someone at the door? He gets excited. So I pick him up and show him that Orlando's outside the window. And he's like, Orlando, can I play with you? And Orlando's like, yeah. You know, they're going ballistic and ready to go play with each other. Honor asks, Honor asks Orlando's mom, Auntie Callie, can I come outside to play with Orlando? And she's like, yeah. And then finally he comes to me, right, to ask me, like, if they were going to give him the, the, the leeway to go. He asked me, Daddy, can I go outside to play? I said, Sure. Let's go to your room so you can change and, and you can go outside to play. And as we're walking to his room, all of a sudden he does this U-turn and turns around and hugs my leg and just gives me the biggest kiss on my leg. I mean, this, this is the only thing he reads. And then he says, thank you. And I'm telling you, that made my day. I felt like the best parent at that moment. <laughs> just his expression of gratitude. And it was genuine. I mean, it was bubbling up from within him. We can recognize genuine gratitude and we can recognize when, eh, that person really didn't mean it or it was somewhat uneventful. Have you, have you ever done something for someone, given them a gift or came through for them in a big way? And 
You didn't get the reaction that you expected? How did that make you feel? Terrible. You felt like they were robbing you of something, right? You felt like you were excited about it. You had some joy bringing it. And then you drop easily. You almost feel like, oh, that person's never getting a gift from me again, or I'm never coming through for them again, because they don't appreciate it. They're, they're, they're ungrateful. My question for each and every single one of us today is, do we do this to God? Does God come through for us? Does he provide? Is he merciful in certain ways and, and that we could never imagine things happening for us if, unless he came through, and yet we don't turn around to give him thanks? We don't turn around to give him praise, and we just kind of go about our day as if nothing happened? We're going to read a story where that happens. It's about ten lepers um, that Jesus heals all ten, and only one of them turns around to give praise to Jesus. So I want you to turn with me, and as we look at this passage, I want us to see the benefits of gratitude at the same time, see why men and women are ungrateful. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 17. If you have your Bible, please open up to Luke chapter 17. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. We have our volunteers going around. If you don't have a Bible at home, feel, uh, Diane, there's one up here, I believe. Uh, feel free to keep it. Thank you. Luke chapter 17. And if you don't mind, please stand with me as we read this first passage. We're going to be reading from verse 11 through verse 19. And it reads, On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered. He answered with questions. Note that. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. You may be seated. I pray that God's word will speak to us today. So here we have 10 men in this story suffering from leprosy. Leprosy could have, could have been any sort of skin disease. Anyone who was suffering from leprosy was cast off from society. They had to live outside of the town. They had to remain secluded, isolated, could not come in contact with anyone else because they didn't want the skin disease to spread. Can you imagine that situation? Can you imagine being cut, cut off from everything you know, from your family, from your friends, from your career, from your job, whatever it might be, just cut off from everyday life because of this leprosy? These men were in a dire situation, a desperate situation. Desperate situation. And all the medical advancements at that time, which were minimal, couldn't help them. Who knows how long they were in the situation? So desperate that they saw Jesus, they probably heard of him, knew something about him, knew that he was healing people, and they said, here's our chance, here's our hope. And they cry out, it says, no, pay, no pity, no shame, they lift up their voice, they cry out and say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Master, have mercy on us. I don't know about you, but I know there's been plenty of times where I found myself in situations that I was desperate, that I was lost, I was broken, I was in need of divine help. And in that moment, your future looks bleak. And at that moment, if you're a Christian, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. You know that the only thing you can do which is probably the first thing we should do, but you know that the only thing you can do is get on your knees and cry out for mercy. Cry out for God's intervention. The funny thing is, if you're not a Christian, the one thing you do is you get on your knees and you cry out for mercy to whatever power you believe in, to a higher power, because guess what? Things, situations, whether it's in need of a job, 
whether the light bill needs to get paid, whether it's a sickness in your body or in someone in your family, whether it's a broken relationship, whatever it is, that situation, you can't look at yourself for the solution. You can't look at your friends. You can't look at those around you. You have to look outside, beyond these four walls, beyond all these people. And you begin to look into the heavens. You begin to look for God to come in, to come through, to break, break through and do something in your life. We've all been there. And we have all had to cry out. And the amazing thing about it, I remember not being a Christian before I was 18, being in some situations that I just made a mess of. It was my fault. I got myself in those situations. I remember just praying, God, if you do this, I will be there. You know, I'm going to commit. I'm going to go to church and never happen. But the, God came through. Isn't that amazing? God comes through. As Christians, when we pray to God, that's what builds our faith when he comes through, when he moves in our lives. But what do we do after? What happens when the miracle comes? What happens when the bill gets paid? What happens when you get that job? What happens when you get that relationship? Do you turn back around like this one leper and just say, thank you, thank you, praising God? Bow at your feet, at Jesus' feet. Bow on your knees, at Jesus' feet. And just, just begin to express this overwhelming joy, overwhelming gratitude to our God in heaven. Or are you like the other nine who just go about their day, who go into the town, get back to work? Yeah, they may be thankful, but they're not expressing it to the giver of life, the healer, of our souls. This is what, as I study this, this was really convicting to me. I'm guilty of being like the other nine. And I believe many of us are. Because of our, just our society, our culture, whatever it might be, whatever we want to blame it on. But I believe there could be a better way. I believe we can live with a heart of gratitude on a daily basis to God and for others. Gratitude is the natural response. You know, the, the one leper that turned around, not only was he healed, but he received somewhat of a double portion, an even bigger healing. If you look at verse 19, it says, this is Jesus speaking to the, to the leper after he had been healed. And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, he was already well, physically. His skin was healed. What, what that is saying is he received salvation at that moment. The word there that, that's usually translated well means he received salvation. He was saved because of his faith, because he returned. He received a double portion. Let me ask you this, and I think I have pretty much alluded to it earlier. When someone is grateful for what you've done, you're more than likely willing to do it again for that person. If they're ungrateful, you know, maybe if you're forced a little bit, you'll, you'll, you'll give in. But gratitude, I believe when, when we're grateful and there's gratitude expressed, there's something powerful taking place between those two individuals. There's a giving and a taking and a receiving and it's just back and forth, back and forth. And you begin to delight in that person. And you're truly happy when you are grateful. Truly happy. That's what I want for each and every single one of us. Here's another thing I want you to, to notice. Now, this, this is my first point, and this is, this is what I want to start with. Gratitude is the natural response. And the, the, the expectation that God has for us. This is the expectation that we have for people when we do something for them. Gratitude is the natural response. Look at Jesus. Look, look at how puzzled he is by the whole situation. Usually we'll read this passage and we'll think it's, it's about the one who turned around. Jesus really, besides that last statement in verse 19, Jesus, his attention is not towards that one. He's, he's mainly focusing on the other nine. Look, look at his, his, uh, his rhetorical questions in verse 17. 
Then Jesus answered, We're not ten cleansed. We're not ten cleansed. He's puzzled. He's bewildered. He doesn't understand. He's like, this doesn't make sense. We're not all ten cleansed. We're not all ten healed. Where are the nine? And again, I like the way the beginning of that verse starts. Jesus answered. He answered with questions. Rhetorical questions like, this doesn't make any sense. It does not make any sense to Jesus that God will move in someone's life and they completely disregard him after the fact. It doesn't make any sense. And then lastly, was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Gratitude is the natural, is the correct. Maybe let me use the word correct instead of natural. Gratitude is the correct response and the expectation from God. So why, why didn't the other nine turn around? Luke doesn't tell us. But I just want to go over two reasons why sometimes we don't turn around. Two reasons. Number one, we believe we are deserving. We believe we are deserving of certain things, of God moving, of people coming through, or God coming through. We believe we are deserving. If we believe we are deserving, we will never be able to express gratitude. Now, in the passage right before this, we're going to see this kind of highlighted. Right before this story of the ten lepers, Jesus is teaching his disciples, and he's basically, basically teaching them the correct response of certain things. So how do you correct, uh, respond correctly in regards to forgiveness? How do you respond correctly in regards to faith? And then in this section, verses 7 through 10, how do you resp- respond correctly in regards to serv- service, in, in regards to serving other people? And this is what he says, verse 7 through 10, same chapter. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him, when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? No. So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. In this parable, Jesus is painting for us the relationship between a master and a servant. Right? He's saying, if you are a master and you have a servant, and that servant's been working outside all day, plowing, picking, doing whatever he needs to do out in the field, and he comes in, do you tell the servant to sit down and eat? No. He's your servant. You tell him, hold on. Dress properly, prepare me something to eat, wait on me. Then after I'm done eating, you can go and eat and drink. And after you've done what you were supposed to do, I'm not even going to say thank you. Because you just did what you were supposed to do. Then we get this story about the ten lepers. Who, remember, said, Master, have mercy on us. But in their actions, they were saying, servant, come through for me. Servant, heal me. They believe they were deserving. Many times we believe we are deserving. We ask our, when we were young, we ask our parents for something. And we just, it's like rude. It's like, really? Do we need to behave that way? And that, that's, that's sometimes how we treat God. When he comes through for us, we just say, that's just what we expected. That's what God is supposed to do. He's supposed to come through for me. He's supposed to give me the job that I want. He's supposed to give me the relationship that I want. And if he doesn't, guess what? Uh, things are rocky between me and God. It happens to us all. We believe we are deserving. We believe we are deserving. So guess what? We can't express gratitude. But when we recognize I am so unworthy of God even doing anything for me, let alone sending his son, Jesus Christ, to pay for my sins. Out of that understanding of our position before God, that we are truly the created being, he is the creator, that we are the servants, and he is the master, that he is the Lord, when we begin to understand our position before God, 
when we begin to understand our position with other people, when they come through for us, that they didn't have to do it for us, we will begin to be more grateful for those around us and for our God. So, if we believe we are deserving, we will never be able to express gratitude. The second thing, discontent. We are unable to express gratitude in the areas in which we are dissatisfied. We are unable to express gratitude in the areas which we are dissatisfied. I want you to think about this. I believe that many of our moral failures are due to dissatisfaction. Many of our failures, whatever you want to call them, sins, many of our sins, our weaknesses are due to dissatisfaction. Let me put it to you this way. If a man is satisfied with his sex life with his wife, there is no need for him to turn to an affair, and there is no need for him to turn to pornography because he's satisfied. If a person is satisfied with the financial provision that God has made in their life, there's no need for them to turn to stealing or there's no need for them to make unethical decisions in order to get financial gain. If a person is satisfied with their situation, there is no need to go outside of God's boundaries and God's plans. If you're satisfied, if you're grateful for what you have, for where God has you, you will begin to delight in God. You will begin to delight in that relationship with him. But if you are not satisfied, guess what? You're looking for ways out. You're willing to make compromises. Honestly, I believe the key to our relationship with Christ, with God, is delighting in him. Delighting in him, a joy, a happiness, a thankfulness, a gratitude between us and God for everything that he has done for us. I believe if you are willing to take the t- challenge of, of developing a, a grateful heart in your life, it will completely change you. It will change you. What you struggled with before, you won't struggle with anymore. The relationships that were broken before, those things will be rest- restored. Because you will begin to express a heart and a gratitude to that person that it will repair any broken roads. I truly believe that. Will we do it? We have so much to be thankful for. So much. Can you just think of one thing right now that you're thankful for that's happened in the past year? To God or from someone else? I believe we can go beyond one thing. Life, family, friends, just having a roof over our heads, food to eat, clothes to wear. If we have those things, what else do we need, really? What else do we need? Psalm 50, verse 23. It reads, He who brings thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. This is God. He who brings sacrifice, he who brings thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. Just thanking God brings glory to him. All your attention is just focused on him. It brings glory to him. Gratitude. Here's my challenge for you. My, my son taught me this, and, and I know I talk about my son a lot, and I, I don't want you to think I think he's super spiritual or anything, but we, we just learn so much from, from children. I mean, it's just amazing. When, when Honor began to pray, um, his prayers would go something like this. Thank you for Mommy. Thank you for Daddy. Thank you for Orlando. Thank you for the ball that I played with Orlando. Thank you for the TV. He would basically go throughout his whole day and tell God his whole day and just thank God for his whole day. And he, and he still does that. And it just amazed me. Like, he understand. he's practicing a, a, a principle that we find in Scripture. We, we see Paul telling the Ephesians, give thanks to God for everything through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
We see that in the Old Testament, the Levites in the, in the temple had, certain Levites had a specific job. Their job, these Levites, in the morning, they gave thanks to God. At night, they gave thanks to God. We see David, how he prayed. David in the, mor- in the morning would ask God for mercy just to go throughout the day for strength and for God to be with him. And at night, he would come and just give thanks to God. Just give him praise for, for being with him and for just moving in his life throughout the day. Every day he would do this. And, and my question, will we take the challenge of just beginning to build that habit in our life? Of giving thanks to God. Of expressing it to others around us. Just, just go about your day and night. Start today. Just thank you, God, for this. That, for coming to church, for being with good people. Whatever it is. Just be grateful.